Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining in today. Uh, we will begin shortly. All right, I think we can begin now. Good evening, everyone. I am Yashima Jain, a member of the organizing team of Solar Decathlon India. Thank you for joining us here on a Sunday evening. In today's webinar, you will learn why the energy performance of your building and how you can use simulation and analysis to optimize your building design for high performance. You will also learn about parametric and sensitivity analysis the energy, energy conservation measures and get an overview of the energy conservation building code. Please send in your questions at any time during the session through the Q&A window. We will take your questions towards the end of the webinar. Next slide, please. Now, before we get to it, I would like to thank our program supporters and affiliates for this year. These organizations have provided immense support to Solar Decathlon India and catalyzed our transition to a net zero future. If your organization is willing to join forces in this effort, feel free to reach out to us. Next slide, please. Now for today's webinar, we have Tanmay Tadhagat with us. Tanmay is the executive director of the Environmental Design Solutions a multidisciplinary consulting firm focused on addressing the issues of sustainable development in the built environment. Tanmay is an acknowledged expert in building energy simulation and has been working closely with governments for developing sustainable policies for the built environment and supporting program implementation. 
Thank you for joining us today, Tanmay. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Namaskar. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the outline of uh, the presentation today that uh, Yashima uh, talked about is uh, quite a handful. So there's a lot of things that we will be talking about today. Now you all know that this is uh, a beginning of the series of uh, technical webinars and there's also uh, a lot of other materials, informations, and education sessions that over the next uh, few weeks and months, uh, you'll go in more in depth uh, in, in uh, designing, understanding of different tools. And uh, the idea today was to focus on the high level approach to designing a net zero energy buildings and uh, how would you conceptually get to achieve the requirements of this contest? So broadly, the, the contest requirements are that number one, the building needs to be highly energy efficient. Highly energy efficient is uh, is measured in terms of the energy use per year by that building. And that energy use uh, per square meter becomes the energy performance index or energy use index. Or, so you will you, you'll hear these terms EPI or EUI throughout this uh, process. And uh, essentially it's the, uh, the overall energy required by the building to provide all the functions and divided by the area. So the first step in that is to uh, reduce the requirement for heating or cooling appliances. Uh, and all other equipment that one has within the building. So how do you reduce the energy use? And that's called the load. So again, the, you know, these, some of these terms will be new uh, and some of them are also confusing. So this is, uh, you know, you, the word load is uh, not just a structural load. Whenever we talk about loads in this process, we're talking about the, the electrical load or the energy required for uh, running the building. Right. So how do you reduce the uh, and in some cases also the heat load or the cooling load. So you have to understand which load one is talking about at a particular point of time. Here we're saying that uh, reduce your load through better form envelope. Envelope means all the wall, windows, roof, the skin of the building, lighting. Plug loads, plug loads means all the equipment that you plug into the wall that are not necessarily a part of your design, but which the occupants will require. So, you know, televisions and computers and printers, servers, etc. Similarly, appliances. Uh, and you have to do this through a annual analysis. You have to essentially show that your energy use in all of these things is low. Second, uh, comfort system is another word for how do you provide uh, cooling, heating if uh, for maintaining a minimum standard of comfort for the occupants. And how can it be done using the least amount of energy? Once you have a building with a low energy performance index, low EPI, then you need to also now worry about how do you get the residual energy, the, the actual amount of energy that still is required to be, uh, to be produced on site and uh, uh, using renewable means. So how does one integrate that much 
uh, energy generation on site. And finally, uh, the building is not isolated. It's a part of a grid. So how do you balance the, sometimes the energy may be required to be uh, purchased from the grid or supplied to the grid. And uh, that uh, approach will also be a part of your thinking. So these are the competition requirements. A lot of what I'm talking about today comes from uh, uh, our experience of working on this project called METRI, which is Market Integration and Transformation for Energy Efficiency. It's a project uh, uh, which is uh, efficiency and renewable energy integration in buildings, cooling, and uh, uh, you can find some of this information on the METRI website. So let's begin. You know, wh why are we interested in net zero? Uh, in a traditional sense, buildings use a lot of uh, natural resources and material, and those are input into the building, either in building design or in operating the building. But the output of those things is usually an environmental problem. So building materials, uh, brick, cement, steel, tiles, all kinds of things that go into raw material. Uh, at the end of the life of the building, everything is a rubble and a construction waste that goes to a landfill. Energy, essential for running the building, but at the end of the process, the energy results in uh, heat, uh, all kinds of uh, CO2 and uh, other emissions because of producing production of that energy. Similarly, water comes in, we use it in the building, but in the end it becomes sewage uh, and a problem to be dealt with. All kinds of things like that. So uh, a net zero energy building uh, or a sustainable building will try to uh, close this loop as much as possible. So the building material does not produce construction waste, which is sent to a uh, landfill, but it is reused for some purpose. Energy is generated in a way that it does not produce carbon dioxide. There is high efficiency so that there is very little or no waste heat generated. And whatever waste heat is generated can be used for some good purpose, maybe say heating water. Uh, water can be used for again, you know, treatment, filtration, reuse, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the concept of the, you know, reducing the environmental impact of construction, buildings, our cities, our homes and offices that we're talking about. So how do you design these net zero energy buildings? As I explained, a definition, a net zero energy building is the one that produces as much renewable energy in a typical year as it consumes. So once the building is energy efficient, it consumes power from the grid, energy from the grid when it requires. When it has excess, it'll probably give it back to the grid. Sometimes it can also store it on site in batteries and other things, or maybe charge electric vehicles, et cetera. And two key features are the high level of energy efficiency and second, integration of renewable and and as you will see in your in your design process there are a lot of renewable energy uh, sources that could be integrated on site and there are several building types that can actually be self sufficient in their energy use to be net zero with uh, energy being produced just on site but in some cases let's say you're making a high rise building in bombay or anywhere else where you don't have a lot of area on the building in the site to produce renewable. Sometimes this energy can also be produced off-site, so somewhere else, and it is uh, it is connected to the buildings in many ways. So to understand this term of energy performance index, right? So this annual energy demand or production in terms of kilowatt hours per square meter is the EPI. So you know, I'm, this is an example of a typical office building uh, in, let's say, a hot, warm, humid, or composite climate, so in Delhi or Bombay. Uh, you know, a typical building like this would use 
between 160 to 200 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. So we've just taken an average, let's say 175. So for every square meter of building uses this much energy per year. Now there are building codes. So there is an energy conservation building code, which prescribes a minimum level of energy efficiency. So if the building follows the code, that means it has uh, energy efficiency in its uh, design specification and equipment, uh, it will reduce its energy use from 175 to 120. Now energy efficiency code can also be up, uh, you can also follow a, a, a higher level of energy code, which is called the super ECBC. So ECBC energy conservation building code has three levels, ECBC, ECBC plus and super ECBC. Super ECBC is the most stringent and is called the near zero standard. So if you follow the specifications of super ECBC, your building energy use comes down to 90, right? But that doesn't mean that there can't, there can't be anything else that can be done. You know, super ECBC is still a code, which is again, meant for larger commercial buildings. Uh, there are other strategies one could use to bring down energy use even further by let's say using some of these low energy comfort systems. So in an ideal net zero energy building, I would have reduced my energy performance index from 175 to 60. And this is the theoretically the lowest energy use my building could have. And then once we have done this, we see, okay, can we produce the 60 kilowatt hours per square meter per year on site to balance it so that this becomes a net zero building. And that's the concept that we will follow. And we need to keep lowering our EPI and reach the lowest possible. Now, all of this is new because we don't know how to calculate or measure uh, these EPIs. And that's something that you learn over a period of time. For this uh, competition, there are uh, target energy performance index that have been given. Now, this is coming out of work that we did when, when we developed ECBC. Uh, then a lot of these uh, building types were studied. So a lot of uh, analysis was done to say, what is a super ECBC target? Now, technically, as I explained, these are good numbers to get, but you could go lower. You could go lower than all of these. The residential numbers are also coming from research done on residential building as a part of development of the residential code. So uh, one should look at these as the minimum that one should achieve. But uh, my uh, experience is that, you know, these can be done uh, better. The net zero approach is not just in design. It's also in how you specify your material, what would be your wall, roof, window material, uh, their thermal performance, etc. how it is constructed and how it is operated. So, you know, when you look at a net zero approach, please look at the complete life cycle of the building. Although we are talking only about net zero energy, later you will also uh, like to think about net zero carbon and other uh, metrics that go beyond just energy use in the uh, operation of the building, but they also consider the energy use and the environmental impact of materials produced. But for this presentation today, we are focusing on the energy used in running the building and operating the building. So what are the five steps to get to net zero, right? Number one is design. So passive solar design and appropriate sizing. Sizing becomes very important. You know, any uh, area that is superfluous, that is that can be minimized uh, is your net zero. Uh, more than net zero, it's net zero carbon. You know, it's the greenest building you can make is the one that you never make or never have to make. So look at the area statements, look at the way you can reduce the build up volume and whatever is built needs to be built according to the climate and uh, the approach towards a passive design for comfort. Secondly, you've use materials that provide additional energy efficiency. You do energy efficient lighting, 
energy efficient air conditioning system or cooling or heating system if required. So one, we will try to provide the occupants of the building with comfort using only passive measures. But then, you know, you if, if you still feel there are uh, hours that uh, some cooling or heating is required, you'll make a low, com low energy comfort system. Then you look at renewable energy. Again, renewable energy is not just electricity. It's also hot water. There are also uh, solar cooling and heating technologies that you will probably hear about in, later in the process and you can research. So there are solar air conditioners and there are several new technologies. So once you've done the design material, you look at how renewable energy is integrated right, into your building. Then you look at how can you optimize what the op occupants bring in, uh, electronics, office equipment, appliances, uh, what is the specification that we would want for those. And the last point is how do you operate this? Because no matter how you design, if even if your energy, uh, uh, your comfort system, your air conditioning system is extremely comfortable, if somebody runs it all the time, or uh, uh, runs it at a very low uh, set point, you want 18 degrees in your room all the time, then achieving net zero is not possible. So operations, set point, and frugality in using as little energy, as uh, few equipment as one can is the key to actually achieving net zero. And as, as designers, these are things that you can actually code into the building that you know, is there is a way to operate this building and I'll show some of the ways in which it can be done. So all of this then gets you a net zero energy building. In your design thinking and your process, I would want you to uh, think about it in this way. Uh, it's quite logical, it's quite straightforward. Some of it may be new, but it's not complicated. Uh, we have a website called uh, net zero uh, nzeb.in, which is an nzeb knowledge portal, where a lot of this information is, is there, right? So it has a knowledge center, which has design uh, related ideas. It has case studies. It has ideas about uh, uh, what are the products and technologies available. And uh, there's a way you can uh, ask questions and, and, and get support from the net zero community in the country. There are also uh, webinars. All of this is part of the METRI effort uh, on net zero. And there are, I think, almost 45 webinars with experts presenting case studies of buildings. So you will know a lot about net zero energy buildings and how they're built, et cetera, on this uh, website. And as I said, this is the path you need to follow. Passive solar design, number two, active strategies. Active strategies means strategies that use energy. Third, equipment. Fourth, behavioral aspect and renewable energy. So, you know, on this website, you have design strategies for energy efficiency. How do you increase natural ventilation, better insulation, etc.? Uh, a focus on daylighting and energy efficient lighting, energy efficient cooling systems. So, different things like ground source heat pumps and evaporative coolings and whatever new methods one could think of to cool the building or heat the building without uh, using as much energy as conventional system. And finally, energy efficient appliances, including solar appliances and the integration of renewable energy in the building and with the larger grid. This kind of a building is also, you know, the next step is, is a grid interactive net zero energy building. That means uh, the building is, is, is not isolated. It is smart, it is connected, and it is flexible. So when uh, it has excess energy, it can give it back to the grid, right? If it has uh, uh, a requirement for energy, it can take it from the grid. It can store some of this energy in, uh, say, batteries for later use. It can put it in uh, EVs. 
and these electric vehicles can then be uh, uh, charged and run on uh, uh, on let's say renewable energy and it's also possible that you know when there is let's say excess energy use in the network that means everyone has switched on their air conditioning let's say 3 o'clock in the afternoon and summer day then this building can say okay you know at this point of time i can reduce my building load so that the overall energy grid does not get overloaded that means i don't need to start a new power plant to meet that load for a few hours right and buildings can help in cleaning the the entire network by reducing their energy demand during peak hours sometimes you'll be surprised to know that building only require you know this peak energy for only a few hours of a day and that to a few days in a year right so so uh, just for those few hours for a few days uh, you either get a blackout or you need to build more power plants which is again not good for the environment so the idea is buildings are grid responsive so they're also helping the overall energy production to be green this is an example for it you know so it, th this is the it, the energy use profile of a building let's say so in the afternoon it has more energy use in the morning let's say people are comfortable they're not switching on their air conditioning so at that time i have more say renewable energy available let's say for example and i can charge my solar my batteries in the car uh, and it's possible that if there's you know one option is of course these cars can then go and do their work but if some of these cars are still not discharged at the time when there is a peak in the in the building my battery from the car can run the building it can provide energy back into the building just one example so you you know you have a utility grid your car your rooftop pv and home appliances all part of this network so what is the key to this as a designer what do you do how do you reduce this energy use right and if you think about it lighting you have a pretty straightforward way you know you can do better natural light daylight and very efficient lighting good controls it's a straightforward thing you know you, you do a, a design that allows good daylighting uh, other electrical equipment of course you can buy energy efficient equipment and specify but how do you how do you reduce energy use in cooling and heating is by providing better thermal comfort naturally now there are several ways to quantify it right as a start of the design process and again you will have more webinars on this is to understand comfort right this you don't need to uh, get into the details of this slide but all it says is that for a given temperature the for a given sorry climate and for a given uh, weather uh, climate conditions outside people can be comfortable inside in a band of temperatures so you know here for example it's from 25 to 19 uh, and this band of temperature keeps going up as the outside gets warmer so when the outside is 30 degrees according to this then the comfort range is between let's say uh, 29 to 24 or something like that so the 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 adaptive comfort model allows this ability for you to design buildings that respond to the out, outdoor conditions and some of it can also be modulated inside by using good ceiling fans so a good ceiling fan which is running let's say at at a certain speed you know low speed also it's 0.8 meters per second is the equivalent of uh, providing a comfort of about 2.5 deg degrees celsius right this so upper scale is celsius and air speed that's another way and we all know that we've experienced that so the first thing you will do in your design is write down your areas and the different spaces that one has in the building 
look at the ambient conditions what is the worst case outdoor condition that summer monsoon winter has and in each space what's the temperature condition i want to maintain and maybe humidity as, as well if it's a humid climate or very dry climate these will start your journey towards achieving these temperatures right and and you may not in the end may not achieve it but it's good to start off with this is what we want to do and again these are examples from various projects so don't copy any of this directly uh, this is just illustration uh, this is for a large house in ahmedabad so you know your temperature conditions and comfort conditions may be different and then you say that in each area of this house these are the number of people and this is my you know typical lighting and equipment that will be added so then you understand all the energy and heating and cooling load that one needs to meet because your lighting and equipment will also add heat uh, to the space right the next thing that we do is look at the climate now you will have a lot of sessions on climate understanding uh, climate and doing climate analysis but you know what do you get out of it the the idea is that the building needs to be comfortable in every season throughout the year so i look at my climate conditions through the year and divide them into segments that are very similar now this is again ahmedabad so there we said december january is winter you know february is very different it's neither hot nor cold it's nice comfortable weather march and april is hot may and june is hot and dry july august are hot with maybe some rain september october is again comfortable and cool and november is probably a, another comfortable season right so broadly look at wherever you are designing to say which are the key segments because you know you can't design for every hour of the day you segment it some some places may have only four distinct uh, seasons some may have five six you know here we have tried to be then in each segment what i would recommend you look at what are the temperature conditions what are the humidity conditions is there is is the sky cloudy clear what kind of sky conditions exist is there wind where is it coming from what direction what speed and in certain cases what is the ground temperature because i can do certain things with the earth air tunnels ground source heat pumps etc cetera, etc cetera. so i need to know what the ground temperatures are based on this analysis what would be my architectural response to this climate what are the possibilities if the temperature is too high radiation is too high what do i need to do in terms of design what are the passive systems that can help and finally what kind of active systems what kind of low energy comfort systems will work the best in that season right based on all of this you have a design that works through the year now in this presentation i have used a software called climate consultant this is a free to use tool and you will get a, a sense of this but i'm you know i have done this analysis for all segments of the of the year i'll only cover one or two to give you an example so let's say we take december and january here we say the temperature and rh range this is the relative humidity in green this is the temperature in yellow and this light gray band here is the comfort parameter between 20 and 25 let's say so here i see that during this period i have certain periods when the temperature is actually lower than my comfort conditions at night during the day it's more or less okay with maybe an hour or two slightly above this my humidity is maybe 65% but during the daytime it may be dry the ground temperature range is between you know uh, 30 to 24 uh, or sorry 18 and my uh, sky has a little bit of cloud cover so i say sky cover 20% uh, good solar radiation uh, in december there's a little bit of a shade wind velocity i get 7 meters per second and you know mean is around 2 meters a second this is the ground temperature 
so what does it mean that means in this season to be comfortable i need some insulation because i have hours which are below a uh, comfort condition but the ground temperature at that time time is still high you know so when when my temperature outside is low my ground temperature is still quite comfortable so i could do something like earth air tunnel to keep maintaining 20 22 degrees or you can do a you know there's good radiation so one could trap the heat uh through windows and greenhouse to uh, make the space comfortable right so there are various things one could do passively and then of course actively that means is good temperature a good heat pump will work solar heat system will work because there's good radiation uh, radiant cooling system etc etc so they'll work right i do this for every season i see february february is great you know it's mostly comfortable not much to be required to be done then i go to march april you know temperature changes you see most of the time the temperature is around 40 degrees right daytime temperature is up to 40 degrees my uh, but the sky is clear right ground temperature in this season is around 27 degrees what can we do you can do night time cooling we can see that the night time temperature here are still in comfort range you know around 20 something 23 24 so i can do night cooling i can cool my building at night and trap that heat inside i do need great shading architecturally in this time and of course you do need some good cooling system for the rest of the time when the temperature is 40 degrees this kind of analysis is very useful in setting your strategy right but this so you get a sense of all the things one can do and then once you have that understanding you look at the codes and standards so the ecbc code and the eco neva samhita will give you the minimum or the best the way you see it whether you look at ecbc or super ecbc specifications for wall windows roof etc so the ecbc sets you know the minimum is about 25% better than the conventional building and super ecbc is roughly 50% you know that's towards that's called a near net zero energy building so that's the minimum one needs to go for right uh then you look at active systems right so we've talked about passive systems specifications so i know that i have done good design good specification for my whatever you know that will come out of this and again i am not going to go into the detail this slide presentation will be with you but you know the way i we typically do it we say okay these are all the possible system types there's ground source heat pump system these are the pros cons does it work does it not work there's an earth air tunnel system what are the benefits what are the cons it requires you know a large area is high cost high maintenance it only works for a few months etc so you know maybe not recommended uh solar cooling maybe because there's a lot of sun in amdabad during those summer months so maybe there's a possibility that one could do at least daytime solar cooling and maybe other options right so you know we go through this kind of an analysis of different strategies and again look at it high level do your pros and cons and in the end again you know i'm not explaining this you will get the understanding of this in the end we got my our thermal performance from ecbc we did our system recommendations broadly and then we said what is the requirement of this system so you know what's the cost how much energy it will require what will be the annual energy consumption what will be the operating cost what will be the water consumption so certain things like passive cooling will require more water some will require less water and then what is the architectural impact some will require space in the basement some will require something on the rooftop this is the study that you do need to do to begin with in terms of your understanding of climate understanding of technologies this is before you even do anything on paper right then you start because now you got a sense of what are the various options available to you what is the climate like you know should i even start looking at a building that is 
above the ground or maybe below the ground because it's a great temperature. All kinds of strategies will come to your head once you've done this thinking beforehand, right? You will learn about simulation. Now, you know, if I have done this, I could actually model this in a simulation software to compare because, you know, designing the system intuitively is what you've done the first step. The second step is then to validate that using some analysis, which again, you will, you'll get examples. There are, uh, you know, you, uh, uh, you'll be using design builder, which is a great tool for estimating uh, the actual performance of your building. So here again, you said, okay, you know, this is the annual cooling energy required for different cooling systems. And uh, one could take a call now, depending on energy cost and all different parameters, right? So in this case, after all this analysis, we said, okay, this is the system that we recommend. And this is the reason for doing so. Now, this thinking is important because in this competition, it's also important that you explain your ideas and how you've arrived at the decision. It's not just a design, right? So you also have to produce a report that gives you uh, an opportunity to explain your thinking process. And the last bit, once you've done all of this, right? You've designed a building strategy. This is what I meant by operational part. You know, for every part of that year, I'm giving a operating manual to the occupant that, okay, in December, January, your night temperature is low, day is comfortable, ground source heat pump should be operating. You got good insulation and wall and roof. During day, this is the daytime, no air conditioning is required and you're fine from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Let's say in May and June, throughout the year, air conditioning needs to run because you have temperature that are high, night, night temperatures are also high, uh, air conditioning is required, you could need good insulation, et cetera, right? So this is an operating manual which says, okay, these are the hours where passive system is enough to meet your comfort requirements. You don't need to run any cooling heating system. This is the time when you may need to do something. This design plus specification gets me to my net zero building, right? And I've shown what are the different strategies that I've used to get my building to net zero. In a very similar way, you need to look at water. I'm not gonna talk about it, but it's the same process. Look at your resources, look at your rainfall, et cetera, et cetera, and waste. Look at how the waste is produced, where it is going. And you know this is a sort of broad approach of thinking through the process. Now, there are some good examples. So uh, again, there'll be several case studies that you can find on the NZEP website. Uh, and there'll be several that are presented. Reach out to these people if you need more information. Um, Nalanda University campus in Rajgir is a large campus with all kinds of buildings, central, uh, centrally cooled, individually cooled, uh, residential offices, classrooms, all net zero. And amazing uh, micro uh, climate modifications and all kinds of water and other strategies. Jaguar headquarter building in Manesar, it's an energy efficient building, a lot of passive strategies, good shading. And as you can see in the picture on the right, a lot of photovoltaics integrated on the building, on the boundary walls, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Center of Science Environment has an Anil Agrawal training, Environmental Training Institute in Nimli. Another net zero energy campus, hostels, residential buildings, office buildings, classroom, all designed to be highly energy efficient and net zero. Uh, hostel blocks for Central University of Rajasthan in Ajmer, uh, has great case studies. They have done different cooling strategies, passive cooling strategies for different hostel blocks. So some may have ground source heat pump, some have earth air tunnels, etc. And then again, IIT Jodhpur campus designed as a net zero energy campus. Several several strategies being used and integrated. You'll get good information from there. Uh, so all of this is open to you, available to you. The thinking process is what I have explained. Look at climate, look at simple strategies, then model them in your energy simulation software, 
that will give you the energy performance index and then you optimize that in a similar process you will get for renewables because once you studied the climate you studied the occupancy pattern you also know how much energy uh, can be generated on site through various means and you have the approach for meeting those things with renewable energy on site so i hope i've given you a perspective on the process it's not enough time to go in detail of any one of these uh, this whole presentation is available to you and i'm available for questions thank you all right thank you so much tanmay uh, we've been getting many questions so let's dig right into them um our first question is do people do, do people get climatized to the weather also play a role while designing a building uh yes of course so that's what the adaptive uh, thermal comfort standard means that as the you know it's a, when it's a hot day outside uh you stand in in shade even though it may be 35 degrees you still feel comfortable because you've come from 45 degrees so this does play a role in optimizing how you can reduce energy use within the building let's say you have a lobby space you know the moment somebody is coming from outside from the sun when they enter the building just the comfort of the shade and maybe good breeze and a fan will give them enough comfort that you don't probably need to provide air conditioning right now you know they'll that acclimatization is there so you use this approach in designing the building for sure yes right thank you next question uh, how does nzdb tackle peak hour loads yeah so uh, there are two ways one you have to see the renewable energy options during the hours of peak very often let's say in summers uh, the peak is maybe in the summer afternoon usually there will be enough solar let's say in certain case, cases uh, maybe it's cloudy uh, and you don't have as much sun but you may have wind in maybe monsoon season right so uh, at that point of time you can have a building that can get produce renewable energy at the time of peak but the other way it can handle peak is by storing energy whenever that happens so you can actually produce energy and store it in batteries or as hot water or cold water in different ways and use it when there is a peak time when maybe your production is not at peak so you can do it by either producing energy at the peak time or by storing energy and using that energy at the peak time right all right next question what are the initial and running costs of nzdb compared to a typical building difficult to say a definite number that will be applicable to all cases right uh, but i if you look at it in a, in a in a life cycle cost basis then energy efficiency measures that you incorporate into the building almost always have a very short payback period so you know within 4 5 years at the most you will recover all the cost that goes into the building for passive measures similarly for efficient cooling systems you will recover that cost within at the most 5 years now renewable energy depends on where it is and how much renewable energy you have integrated may take maybe 8 years 9 years sometimes can be lower as well so i would say overall whatever investment goes in making a net zero energy building may be a little bit higher than a conventional building it is usually recovered in in maybe a very short span considering the life of the systems and life of the building all right um next question what are the methods in which we can do such a detailed analysis like software reference materials etc how can we measure our buildings on these parameters like site analysis or by software or simulation yeah so i, I understand maybe prasad you can add to it there are other tools and software that you'll be exposing everyone to but uh, you know the first step is to do more uh uh thinking and before you jump into a software analyze the data that you have 
just you know i mean for some of these things even a simple excel graph gives you a lot more information but yes then there are other tools that you'll need for analyzing your design analyzing equipment and integrating solar but uh, maybe prasad you want to add yeah i'll just add a couple of things here um in the energy performance as well as some of the other self learning modules there is a additional resources document that you've been given uh some of these additional resource documents actually list tools that you can use so for example tanmay mentioned climate consultant it is it is given that you have a link to be able to download it and use it so various other tools have been uh, you've been pointed to through that obviously design builder is something uh, that uh, you're getting access to along with uh, climate studio which is also an energy simulation uh, software and uh, every few um, weeks now we are going to be conducting um, webinars or, or you can call them maybe sort of more detailed workshops on energy simulations so pc thomas is one of our experts uh, he's be, he'll be conducting the webinars that will walk you through some of the energy simulation modeling processes and uh, there'll be i think uh, five on those right yashima total yes five yeah five yeah. five of those uh, in the next few months So you learn from that. We'll also have another person uh, who will come in along with um, PC Thomas at that time. Her name is Mansi, and she'll be talking more about how she's used simulations in her practice. So you'll start getting some insights on that as well. Tanmay, maybe you can just you know quickly talk about uh, you know how how you guys uh, in EDS use energy simulations. what tools do you use and and you know when how do you use them for projects just briefly maybe yeah. sure i mean you know we use the same process that i explained here you know we uh-huh. we don't jump into simulation software first the the idea is to design first using understanding of climate understanding of design understanding of what are the strategies that will work and uh, so to get the first uh, sense of the design using the simpler tools for climate and analysis then for uh understanding the impact so you know so for example you don't need simulation to tell you that a certain orientation will be better for shading or solar access or for producing energy so you do that within that then we have to optimize it further that's when simulation come in so then you create a once a, a simulation model of design typically uh you do a, a a box model in design builder where you can you know create a, a a dabba which you can create in maybe one or two days and you try different options different shape sizes within that to optimize it further and then uh we design the detailed uh measures that will be added to that design, to that building so the different specifications for wall windows roof details of shading daylighting simulations that's the stage when the detailed design uh, simulations are done and that is done in a way that you know the hvac design optimization happens on one end and the daylighting happens on the other but you know your broad setup is already there it's just sort of now refining and fine tuning it and then when it all comes together we do the whole building simulation to look at then hourly energy used and that gives us the both cooling heating load profiles and the electrical load profile so then i know when i need more energy and that's the time we then add the uh renewable energy simulation to say okay now we need to generate this much energy this much in summer this much in winter and what is the size of a pv that i require what's the size of my hot water system that i require and you know optimizing the orientation etc cetera, etc cetera, to get that so you know it's a back and forth process but uh, that's that's a summary and in the end then you do a final uh, integrated uh, analysis when everything is done to calculate the epi that we have achieved to see whether we have reached a target or not thanks sir ma'am and as far as tools are concerned i guess yeah so design builder is great we use equest quite a bit for uh, early simulation and uh, climate consultant is is good and of course there are some very good uh, simulation tools for uh, uh, renewable energy pv watts etc that we use 
All right. Uh, moving to the next question. Uh, you have explained base EPI for all projects, but how do we set target EPI in an initial stage for on-site construction, on-site workers housing projects? Can we use same EPI target as given for community resilience shelter? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, these EPI targets are, uh, I would say, guide. Guidelines. You're right. You can't really take them literally for every building for every kind. But these are good. These are not baseline. These are actually targets for a energy efficient uh, building. And uh, a worker housing is the same as a residential uh, EPI. So you could use the residential one. Uh, and and the uh, community resilience center shelter also has, from what I understand, some housing component. Uh, where you have the facility or the option of, uh, so, you know, you one could use that as well. So I, but I would say the residential one will be closer to it uh, from the look of it. Right. Okay, next question. Can you tell us how you use simulation early in the design process so that we can use simulations for designing our buildings? As I said, use box models to get broad shapes and do quick analysis for orientation, shading, and just look at two or three metrics that are important, right? So solar decathlon has already given you the metrics that are important. You know, just focus on those, heating load, cooling load, electrical load, four or five things, make a box model with different shapes, which are quick, and that's the early design analysis you would do. You know, the effect of shading, just broad shading, you can add an overhang and see, does it make a difference on my energy use? Things like that. So. Uh, that's that's how I would use uh, early uh, design simulation. Right. Uh, next question. While doing NZDB design, how much how how much important? Sorry, how much importance should we give to embodied energy in the materials? For example, solar PVs. What if the energy required in their manufacturing is more energy in intensive? Yeah. So. Uh, it's a good question. Embodied energy is, of course, very important because we are not just talking about buildings, but you know the global environmental impact of construction and materials. Uh, but you know, while that's a very important concern, and I would say that you would get bonus marks if you did that. The first objective is to look at you know the parameters of net zero energy as defined by the competition for this bit, right, Prasad? Absolutely. Yeah. So do think about it, but that's sort of once you've done the optimization for operation and all of this will be, yeah. All right. Uh, next question. If we don't find climatic data for our site and if the nearest climatic data available is, for example, 250 to 300 kilometers away, how useful is that data? Uh, so, you know, distance doesn't really matter. If you have a similar conditions you could use even from an, another part of the world a similar climate now i would suggest that you just search uh, for this there are research papers written on this topic and uh, there's also guidance on how to choose a weather file which is appropriate for the location that you have if you don't have a exact data for that uh, but you know again if you're in india i would say for the purpose of this competition you can pick up a similar weather data if it's in the similar climate zone. Don't worry too much about it, you know, but just don't switch climate zone. You see the climate zone chart, look at something similar. And uh, for this competition, that should be sufficient. Yeah, I'll just add here, Yashima, uh, Tanmay, that, you know, uh, you have access to the technical resource group who are, you know, some of whom have expertise in simulations and understand net zero energy building design. So if you have a question like this, where you're not able to find climatic data and you're trying to use another weather file, just give a shout to them and see if you know they think that you're doing okay. And you'll get some guidance on that. Right, thanks Prasad. Um, next question. Um, is there any case study available for high rise buildings which are net zero energy positive in India? What design approach do we need to adopt as generally roof area available is not sufficient? Yeah, but by the definition of high rise, you know, 
technically in most places in the country it will be difficult to go over six or seven floors at the most with just a rooftop solar so i don't know of any case studies where there's a high rise building which is net zero in india or anywhere for that matter there are some uh, theoretical designs or designs on paper with a lot of facade and it's uh, you know photovoltaics on the facade and and other things um, but yeah on the building integrated uh, and building rooftop uh, net zero high rise is a tough one i'm not aware hmm. right okay moving to the next question if we are estimating energy usage during a full year does the degree day concept given by victor olge apply well in a tropical country like india does any of the available software take account for this yeah of course so again you know degree day is a good it's approach of clock. looking at the entire you know the the re requirement for heating cooling through the year the only challenge is it's not granular you know you'll have to still look at it in terms of how you design it only tells you that what will be the total net demand for meeting comfort uh or for heating or cooling it gives you a good sense of the climate it's it's a part of your analysis of of the weather conditions and the climate uh and uh, most software now have gone beyond it because they do this analysis hour by hour so you know uh, you can probably use it in early thinking about the climate right uh next question most people living in warm and humid or hot and dry climate zones use solar panels to generate electricity but what about people living in the cold climatic zones what with what can they generate electricity apart from windmills so you know even in warm and humid there are areas which can be get very cloudy for large parts and you don't get solar so don't you know the temperature humidity con conditions uh are one factor you you should probably look at the other two factors the total solar insulation the solar radiation uh in that uh in that location and the wind patterns through the year so in certain cold locations like ladakh and srinagar you still get a lot of sun in the winter but maybe in the you know in 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 other hilly states and northeast you may not uh and there you'll have to look at some alternate source maybe Uh, wind maybe biomass uh, so there may, there may be different options and one we need to look at right next question how does occupancy mapping help in understanding the energy load yeah that's a great question it's very important because any building that you have that you design will not be used and occupied in the same way through the year and depending on who is occupying that space for what purpose their comfort requirements can vary so even in a house the 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 number of people in a bedroom versus a living room at what time of the day so you can optimize both your requirements as well as the way you provide conditioning uh, of the space by using that and and sometimes for example a space is a uh, you know you trap heat in it let's say in a cold climate during the day it may get too hot but that space is not used during the day it's a bedroom used at night when it actually is required when the temperature gets comfortable so understanding of space its occupancy the time at it which is occupied is and the comfort conditions required at that point point of time is important so whether it's sedentary somebody's actively working in a space they're sleeping you can map and and design it for different uh, comfort conditions right um next question how would thermal comfort strategies differ in monsoon than in winter well monsoon you require depending on the temperature you would require good uh, air flow for comfort so you need to uh, improve the ventilation you need to have ceiling fans and if it's a enclosed space you may need a means of dehumidification now there are strategies using uh, passive means using desiccants some of it can reduce the humidity in the space and again the moment you reduce humidity the sensation of comfort increases 
and you get, uh, and, but in, 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 in again, extreme places, the only way to dehumidify uh, would be, let's say, using some amount of cooling to remove the moisture from the air. But in most places, you'll find that, you know, there are passive strategies for both enhancing ventilation and dehumidification that can work. Now, of course, winter is different, right? So winter, you, you need some kind of a heating. You need some way to uh, store heat uh, at night, uh, during the day that can be used at night. Uh, you need uh, to reduce heat loss through the envelope. So you need to make sure your wall, window, roofs are insulated. Uh, you don't get a lot of radiant temperature gain uh, or loss through the building. Your glass needs to be uh, completely insulated. Whereas in monsoon, you know that the ambient air temperature is usually not, not that big a problem. Insulation doesn't give you too much benefit unless you're air conditioning and keeping that temperature inside. So it's a different, completely different ways of looking at these two seasons. Right. Um, next question, I think to start this one is for you. Can we use softwares other than design builder softwares like IES, VE, etc.? Yeah, sure. Um, you can use any software that you want for simulations. Right. Um, just that our workshops would be restricted to design builder only. Yeah. And we will be providing you with design builder and climate studio. Okay, next question. Um, many times the best orientation for sun is not the best for cross ventilation, inclusive of RH effects and daylighting. How do we do this optimization? Which tools do we use? Are there any case studies on them in NZDP? You know, this is a problem with, that every building faces. It's one way or the other. Sometimes there's an adjacent building, sometimes there's a view, sometimes there's an approach and you do not get the optimum orientation for all purposes. So this is where your prioritization comes in. Uh, and you will say, which is the easiest thing to manage and you, which you can compromise on. Let's say shading is easier for you to manage, but let's say daylighting is not, right? Or ventilation is not. So I would adjust my building to get the maximum ventilation, maximum daylight, but maybe for heat gain, I can provide a different strategy for shading, which can work on any orientation. You know, maybe I put a screen or a, a movable shade that can work. So one needs to look at which is the priority for that climate and that function. If my ventilation and RH is the biggest issue, which I can't turn the wind and let it come from the other direction, then I would optimize my building first for that. And then the other things which are within my control by other strategies, I would optimize in a different way. Right. Um, next question. What happens if due to increased global warming and depletion of ozone layer, like in the past few years, we have seen monsoon in months that weren't supposed to experience it. Will the charts still come in handy when the whole cycle gets messed up? What do we do when the very resources that we were supposed to come up, come to our aid, do not meet the required quota for generating this energy? Yeah. That's again, a very good question because the building you're designing should, should be there for 30, 40, 50, maybe a hundred years or more. So, uh, uh, you know, certain things won't change. Hopefully the sun will still come same orientation. And, you know, those things you keep it as well as you can. But, you know, global warming will affect rains, humidity, and maybe cloud cover and temperatures. So there is a bit of resilience that needs to be built into every design in terms of two, for two purposes. One, that there is an extreme and there's a change. Your building still works. You know, it does not, for example, when there's no power, nothing, battery backup fails, it shouldn't be that people are dying inside because of heat or cold or discomfort. Uh, so there is some resilience to that. The second part is that when there's sustained periods, when the seasons shift, uh, the building is able to have enough capacity to meet those requirements. Now you will find, again, if you do a, a search, uh, you will find that there are weather files one can generate for a two degree global temperature rise scenarios. 
And you know, for example, I, one example I meant, failed to uh, mention here is the design of the Indian Institute for Human Settlement IHS campus. Uh, the, the master planning and the designing of that actually used, uh, we, dis we used weather files that were uh, kind of estimating this future scenario with temperature rise and, and was uh, uh, used to see what will be the worst case condition for let's say rainfall and water to say, will this building still be able to work? Should I need to, in, do I need to increase the size of my water storage? Do I need to increase, uh, make more provision that in, in case in future, I have low solar radiation because of more cloud cover that I can increase this area under PV, which may be sufficient for now, but maybe 20 years later, not. So you need to think about it. Uh, it needs to be resilience, needs to be a part of your question part of your equation for uh, designing a net zero energy building. And my, um, can you point them to any uh, sources or something for future weather files? Is that the way to do it? Yeah, so uh, I don't remember it offhand. I'll share it with everyone. There, there are a couple of resources where you can actually put in your data and it based on a lot of other parameters, it'll generate a future weather file. Great. Thanks. Okay, um, next question. Um, can simulation software predict thermal comfort in naturally ventilated buildings or can it only be used for air conditioned spaces? Uh, simulation software can predict comfort very well and Design Builder is a great tool for that. And what you need to look for is the radiant temperature, comfort, all of those things can be modeled for uh, both naturally vented, ventilated and air conditioned buildings. And I, I'm sure you'll get more uh, inputs and training on that. Yep. All right, next question. Educational buildings have vacations and buildings are mostly vacant during that time. Can you give an example? Can you give any example where this situation is advantageous? Well, yes. Yeah. So one of the best things is that, you know, you, you can then ignore the one option is you ignore that period. Building is unoccupied. So what the temperature outside is 50 degrees. I don't need to worry about heating or cooling at that point. So, or it's winter in Ladakh in, you know, three months. So I don't need to really design my heating and comfort system for that extreme period. So that's one way of looking at it, right? The other way is that yeah, also I have more renewable energy being produced at that time, I can export it or store it. But from a practical perspective, you know, this scenario is now changing. I, in our practice, we hardly see buildings that are not occupied by something or the other. So in summer, there's summer school, there are other courses that are happening. So, you know, if you have a building, people would like to use it. And that's a better use of resources to reuse the building for something else, or maybe for the same purposes in different conditions. So it's nowadays rare for an education building to be completely vacant even during that period. Better use of the building resource. But you know, you can look at it depending on your condition. If it's a vacant building, and especially when it's the extreme conditions, you can ignore that period in your design and, and just focus on the rest of the period, it makes our design process easier. Right. Uh, next question. For a high-end vertical residential project, considering the scale, how would we set a target EPI as part of our project goals? Uh, I think the target EPI is that you have your R um, uh, for mid to high-rise buildings. I don't think that should change too much. The Eco Neva Samita has a you know range of the, the only additional energy will come from uh, uh, say elevators and some water pumping, et cetera. But from a building perspective, I think those EPIs uh, more or less should hold. Right, Prasad? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Go by the climate zone and, and use the residential building characteristics. Yeah, another question related to the EPI targets. Uh, does different climatic zone have different EPI target? Should we target an EPI lower than the recommended value? If so, how? Absolutely. So my, I mean, I would want you to do lower than this. This is the super ECBC, et cetera, numbers, but they're, you know, 
they are not the i mean you can do better you can do 30% better than that for all i know and you should so uh, and uh, yes they are different for different climatic zones so uh, there is a range that would vary both based on your uh, your climate and the type of building yeah and we've we've given you targets for different climatic zones so the chart that tanmay tanmay showed in his presentation was for one climate zone there's others there right um so tanmay we are at 516 now uh, we have a few more questions would you like to take them up yeah yeah i'm here yeah all right okay thanks uh, next question uh, residential energy usage is different from energy use in construction worker housing because of all the appliances being used is that okay to set a target epi similar to that of residential itself yeah as i said no so you just have to you know if you look at the epi target you'll also see that there's a breakdown break up of that based on let me just show you i guess uh on the end use so it's possible for you to look at the energy use for appliances for example and and uh if you look at it you know there's an equipment heating cooling pump fans so uh you look at a 1 bhk there's a whole bunch 13 is coming from equipment right so i would look at that and say will it be the same for a worker housing maybe not so yeah i mean don't you can use these for references but you have to understand that where they are coming from uh they're coming from specific sort of typologies and and uh, living conditions and comfort conditions uh and uh, you should definitely look at each one of these as guidance uh, not as absolute number and do better than this okay um next question in times of uncertainties as in the case of the covid pandemic we have seen that residential sector has seen more electrical consumption than it was earlier how do we assume a general electric consumption per year assuming any changes in lifestyle that might happen in future hmm well so why do you think there's more electrical consumption during covid uh, you know the two reasons one is we are spending more time at home so you're using more energy maybe more cooling maybe more appliances and and equipment and hopefully is that kind of energy is not being used in offices at that point of time so it's just a shifting of you know energy use from one place to the other uh and you know these this is once in a century kind of a situation uh and you can't predict what will be the energy use so you know in in again in general terms as long as the building is resilient you know all of our buildings have held up none of the buildings have faced situation where we've had a power shutdown because this excess energy use in the residential zone so you know one is to look at it from a resilience perspective that my building works during whatever changes but at the same time you're right it's very difficult to predict so you know if you can say okay i i'll assume a scenario where there are more equipment and more uh, hours of use within a building uh because of these conditions but that whole scenario building you'll have to justify and make it on your own based on the available data or maybe weather or change in lifestyle so i would again assume that you know these are broad parameters that you should freeze up front and if this is a concern for you then write it and say okay what does it mean in terms of design and how is your design then going to respond to it thanks tanmay uh next question uh we just used a word heat island like how can a net zero building reduce heat island if we are using concrete stone or any other hard materials mm. right so you know the energy use in building does uh, is impacted by uh, the ambient 
conditions around the building so yeah if you have a building which is in a zone which is hot because it has a lot of concrete and dark surfaces that absorb energy that particular building will end up using more energy and will be more uncomfortable so you know i'm i'm trying to sort of divide this question into two parts so one is that, you know, from your energy use perspective heat island is bad so any anything you can do in your design to reduce heat island by having as little area for dark concrete more shading more high albedo and light colored that's good you know it's you need to reduce uh, but the other hand you know uh, if you use concrete stone other hard things it's not the hardness that matters it's actually the 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 ability of that material to store the heat and release it back essentially is what causes it so high heat capacity materials will of course have it more but the other things also that will be in a similar category i would say that you know that's a problem for at a at an urban level we need to deal with it and uh, at a design level for a project one would definitely try to make sure that we have as uh, little heat island uh, as little contribution to this urban heat island effect right uh, next question is design builder a part of bim or is it a different software since modeling the building may be done in bim so bim uh they they're, they're two different things you know but uh, design builder has the ability to take uh, information from bim models so if you're working in bim you could you can export your uh, geometry even specifications uh, from uh, a bim software let's say like revit into uh, design builder so that reduces the uh, the effort that it takes to create a model uh, it's not always the most uh, it's not always seamless because when you design a building in bim you have a lot more detail then what is required in the energy simulation so sometimes you end up with just too many clutter too much clutter in your simulation model and you may need to clean it up but otherwise there is a you know if you're working in bim you can uh, use design builder to uh, export to uh, export your design to uh, to design builder for simulation all right Uh, next question out of all parts like passive architectural design strategies building materials thermal comfort lifestyle etc which is the most important part to optimize or focus to better handle a net zero building hmm well so uh, as you saw the most important thing is to achieve thermal comfort for the occupants because that's what is dri dri driving a lot of your energy use so to achieve thermal comfort first step is passive architectural design and the second step is using good materials that are appropriate for that strategy insulated not insulated shaded uh, heat with large heat capacity or less heat capacity ventilation strategy so uh, that's how i would look at it lifestyle is something that is extremely important is probably the most important from a actual net zero uh implementation perspective right so but it, as a designer your design should provide the ability for somebody to have that lifestyle and be comfortable and and you know individually of course we can all do that in our lives as designers you can only enforce it in a to certain extent for your occupants and your design can drive that behavior right uh, next question how do we tackle energy efficiency in redevelopment projects with respect to change in design program and requirements so redevelopment projects are great because they they you know they are avoiding uh generating waste and use of new material so environmentally that's the best way to go uh but then it offers you know 
it, 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 it creates a lot of constraints on certain things that cannot be changed. So again, you know, I would start this by saying, this is my design baseline. So I have a building which is already facing a certain orientation. And then how do I achieve my, my uh, objectives, the performance indicators that I've set for myself and certain things will, will be difficult to do or impossible within the redevelopment scope if it's, uh, you know, requires a, a change that cannot be done. But again, usually you'll find a way around and some compromise may have to be done, but I would then look at it as a total global environmental impact of my decision and see whether it is worth it, worth its while to maybe not do certain things, but avoid uh, demolishing and reconstructing. Right. Um, we'll take two more questions, Tanmay. Uh, one is, how is the base case scenario calculated? Does the base case vary from the lifestyle and user perspectives? Yeah. So base case will be different. So the, as I said, again, before, when you start the process, write, write down all these things. So this is what we are designing it for. So if it's a, a shelter, then this is how the shelter will be used through the year. And this is the worst case situation when there is a flood and there'll be 500 people in the space and this is how it will be used. Rest of the year, this is how it will be used. So your occupancy and lifestyle will drive your first decision of you know, space. And, and uh, that will then determine your base case scenario. So your operations through the year, considering certain lifestyle, certain comfort conditions will become the baseline. And, and you know, ideally, uh, you wouldn't change that then through the design process. You'll keep, the, keep that as your design parameters as well as constraints. Uh, and you, know, you could say that by my design, I'm now changing and encouraging a behavior change, but then you'll have to demonstrate that it actually can be done. Right. Um, next question, what according to you is the emerging green innovation and technologies that are coming up in the building sector? Not <laughs> enough. <laughs> yeah, so build, you know, construction is, is a very conservative sector. Change is very slow. Uh, but uh, there are people who are trying all kinds of things. So it's tough for me to, you know, give a comprehensive response to this, but with, within, with the context of uh, solar decathlon and, and net zero energy buildings, uh, I would say that there are, uh, there's a very good understanding of, uh, from design and then uh, how do you make a building operate efficiently provide heating and cooling with very little energy use. There are new technologies for providing renewable based heating, cooling, ventilation. Uh, there are some innovative technologies for producing renewable energy on site. Uh, and, and some of them are well known, but adapted to let's say these current contexts. So you can now use the biomass within the building from sewage waste to generate heat, for example. Uh, you can have, uh, you know, we have products now that are photovoltaic panels that produce PV energy from both sides, from top and bottom. So if you have a light colored roof, it can use the reflected sun from the uh, roof as well to generate some electricity. There are uh, panels which generate both hot water and solar in the same panel, improves the efficiency of the solar panel as well as produce heat. So there are, you know, in renewable and comfort system, there are really very interesting things that are now becoming mainstream and cost effective. And, and uh, you should look at them again on our nzeb.in website. You'll find many of these technologies listed. Right. Uh, one last question, Tanmay. Um, can you please explain how to read weather graphs in detail? Yeah, I can. Do we have the time today? Uh, I, I think you'll have another session on this, right? Yeah. 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 So I would say, again, don't worry uh, you know, about all... I, 
the it's when you look at every hour of every year it gets very complex to look at these things and that's why my strategy recommendation is to break it down you know look at it at seasonally so first thing i would do is just look at it three or four broad parameter temperature humidity radiation and say okay mota mota i get three four five segments of a year and then within that i go into great detail to see okay what is important uh and and then you the other thing is this if you have to design this uh it's tough but you should understand the psychrometric chart eventually to be able to understand how these things work because not one of these things work independently temperature and humidity are related and uh, solar radiation adds to that uh, equation so uh, you know in the end it's it's a holistic view but the beginning needs to be simple and segmented all right i think that's all for questions today prasad do you want to add anything no i don't have anything to add thank you all right then okay so uh, once again thank you tanmay so much for a very informative session today and i hope our participants can make the best use of the knowledge that you have shared today uh thank you everyone for participating and we will see you next week for another technical webinar thank bye. you thanks anmay bye, -bye. bye. Sure. good luck everyone